This lecture is a recording of the brain and genetics lecture that was done over three days, starting on Friday, October 2nd, and concluding uh, on uh, Wednesday, October 7th. There's a couple different sections of this lecture. Uh, the first is the ones on the older brain structure. The second will be on the cerebral cortex. And the third will be on the divided brain and genetics. All right. Older brain structures. When we talk about older brain structures, we're referring to brain structures that are older evolutionarily speaking, meaning that these evolved spur first when species on this planet moved from single-celled organisms to multicellular organisms. Uh, eventually, they began to evolve brains along with more additional cells. Uh, brains were would develop over time, though. The oldest brain structures are in the hindbrain. Uh, the very kind of back part of the brain. We start with the brain stem. The brain stem is the oldest evolutionarily of all the brain structures, and they control basic functions necessary for survival. The medulla is in the lower part of the brain stem, and the medulla uh, regulates heartbeat and breathing, or circulation of blood and respiration of air. Directly above the medulla is the pons. The pons controls basic movement, mostly movement in the face. And this would be really beneficial to help with things like breathing uh, along with eating. <clears throat> uh, right above the pons is the reticular formation, sometimes called the reticular activation system. And the reticular formation has two different functions. One is a little bit higher level, and that's to allow us to multitask because it helps filter out signals and sends them to proper spots of the brain, allowing us to have multiple signals going through it. Uh, the, and the other is that it works as an activation system. So it's, it's important in the sleep-wake cycle uh, and helps us understand and helps us deal with alertness and arousal. We know a little bit about this because uh, there was a French and Italian researcher in the 40s who tried to uh, stimulate the reticular formation of a cat that was put to sleep, that was uh, kind of knocked out with drugs. And instantly the cat's eyes popped open and it jumped up really, really high. So we, it, they knew it was dealing with alertness. Uh, and then they severed the reticular formation from the cat's brain and the cat instantly went into a coma. Directly next to the reticular formation, but not part of the brainstem is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is associated with coordinated movement and balance. David Beckham, who you see on the screen here, was really good at having a really high levels of coordination to spin the ball and have, and he had excellent balance. Um, so he had a pretty active cerebellum. Uh, the cerebellum also, because it controls our coordination and balance, is also where we store the memories of skills that are connected to coordination and balance, like walking. Uh, or running, or basically any physical skills. Then they say it's like riding a bike. The memories of riding a bike are stored in the cerebellum. In the midbrain, we have three different brain structures that are all put together called the limbic system. The limbic system is uh, the emotional center of our brain. Uh, and each of these three brain structures uh, connects to our emotions in different ways. The first is the hippocampus, and the hippocampus is associated with factual memory and episodic memory. Episodic memory being memories of those episodes in our life or different events that we experience within our life. Uh, these have an emotional context uh, always, um, so which is what makes it emotional and part of the limbic system. The amygdala uh, is a small little structure that deals with our emotional response. Uh, and while it certainly does deal with our positive emotions, like happiness, uh, happiness also has an additional piece and a different structure. Uh, and so thing, negative emotions like rage and fear and jealousy uh, are more prevalent within the amygdala. Finally, we have the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus has a couple different functions. Uh, the first is to deal with those positive emotions because the hypothalamus is where we have the reward center within our brain. Uh, so whenever we carry out a positive emotion or positive thing and we feel good about it, it's that reward center that's being active. Now, that reward center also is uh, influential in things like addiction. Uh, we know this because there were researchers who put an electrode to a rat's hypothalamus. Uh, they 
uh, put food on one side of a box and put the rat on the other and the rat would not and an electrified grid in the middle like you see in the picture here the rat would not cross the grid to get the food however when the pedal was uh pressed down it stimulated the reward center in the rat's hypothalamus uh, and even though the rat was on the other side of the electrified grid, uh, it was willing to hurt itself in order to get to that pedal to stimulate its reward center, showing just how powerful that feeling is. Additionally, the hypothalamus is also important in maintaining the body's homeostasis, which is our state of internal balance. And the way it does this is by controlling the endocrine system. All of our hormones uh, and glands contribute to us being in balance, everything from sleeping uh, to eating uh, to reproduction to blood sugar uh, to metabolism. So uh, because of this, they, all those things contribute to our internal state of balance. The hypothalamus controls all of that. In the forebrain, uh, we have the thalamus, and this is the last of the oldest brain structures. And the thalamus is kind of like the brain's message center. It receives signals from other parts of the body, the internal organs, the uh, nerves in our skin, uh, and the signals are sent to the thalamus, and the thalamus sends them to the proper spot of the brain. Uh, additionally, when the brain wants to send out signals to things like our muscles uh, or our internal organs, they send it, it sends it to the thalamus first, and the thalamus will send it to the proper spot of the body. Think of the thalamus kind of like a train station where trains come in from all over the land. They meet in the train station, which then directs them to their next locations. When we talk about the forebrain, the cerebral cortex is the main part of the forebrain, and these are the newer brain structures. And the cerebral cortex is kind of that gray, squishy, uh, wrinkly outer layer of the brain. Now, none of the brain structures would do anywhere close to well if they didn't have the glial cells. And the glial cells are sometimes referred to as glue cells because they keep everything together. Uh, but the glial cells, what they do is they provide nourishment to the neurons of the nervous system. Um, if there's about 300 billion neurons, there's about 500 trillion glial cells. Now, in our cerebral cortex, we can split it into two hemispheres, left and right. Each of these hemispheres can operate independent of one another. In addition, uh, each hemisphere sends a signal to the opposite side of the body. So the right hemisphere of the brain controls the left side of the body. And the left, left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. The corpus callosum is the part of the brain that connects the two hemispheres. It's a piece of tissue that connects the two hemispheres and allows for signals to pass back and forth between the two. Now, having the corpus callosum means that the two sides can work in unison as well as independent from one another. But sometimes there are some people who experience seizures if they have an overactive corpus callosum. Uh, there is a operation called a hemispherectomy where they sever the person's corpus callosum. And although it takes some therapy, the person's brain will adjust and each side will operate more independently, but still maintain overall function for the person. The cerebral cortex can be split into four lobes, and each of these four lobes uh, has a left and a right side for the two hemispheres. Uh, the frontal lobe is located just behind the forehead at the front of the brain. It's the one in blue in the picture here. The parietal lobe, the one in green, starts at the top center and goes to the top back part of the brain. The occipital lobe, the one in pink, is in the back and bottom portion of the brain. Uh, and the temporal lobe, the one in purple, uh, is uh, just above the ears. It goes from the temples to behind the ears. The primary functions of the cortex are to control our sensory cortices, or these subcortexes that deal with information from our different senses. The somatosensory cortex, located at the very back of the frontal lobe deals with our sense of touch. When signals come up through the thalamus, it then gets sent to the somatosensory cortex where we experience touch. Certain limbs, however, active, activate more of the cortex than others. And this is due to their overall sensitivity. So the more sensitivity uh, the limb or part of your body, uh, the more uh, active its signals are going to make the somatosensory cortex, showing that uh, there's a direct correlation between how much of the cortex is active and how much pain or touch we feel. The motor cortex is at the very front of the parietal lobe, and the motor cortex sends signals out to our muscles to make them move. Uh, now, just like I mentioned before, when we send out a signal to muscles on the right side, it is the left side of the motor cortex that's sending it, and 
the right side of the motor cortex is sending it to the left side. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting is that we can't send out conflicting signals from the same side of the motor cortex. Uh, so uh, we did this in class, but uh, if you want, you can take your right hand and move it in a circular clockwise motion, uh, and then try to take your right ankle and rotate it in a counterclockwise motion. It should be impossible because the brain can't send out the, the left side of the motor cortex can't send out a clockwise and then counterclockwise signal at the same time. Uh, but if you try to do that on the left side uh, with your left ankle, go counterclockwise while well, clockwise with your right hand, uh, then it should be pretty easy uh, because each side of the motor cortex can send out uh, signals independent of one another. In the occipital lobe, we have the visual cortex. The visual cortex is where we experience our sense of vision. Uh, if we have something like massive trauma or uh, brain disease or chemicals from psychoactive drugs that can stimulate the cells in the visual cortex, it can create hallucinations where we see things that our eyes don't experience. In the temporal lobe, we have the auditory cortex. The auditory cortex uh, is deals with our sense of hearing, and it's, they're located directly above the ears. <clears throat> now, outside of the sensory cortices, um, we also have a lot more of uh, the cerebral cortex that kind of hasn't been discussed. Well, all those additional pieces are referred to as association areas, and this is where we do more advanced level thinking. And the more association areas a species has, uh, the more advanced they're going to be. And this picture on the bottom with the different animals really demonstrates that idea. Each lobe has its own separate association areas. <clears throat> the frontal lobes association areas are connected to judgment, planning, processing, and consequence. Uh, it's one of the last parts of the brain to develop and won't develop until about the age of 25. The occipital lobes association areas uh, allow us to think visually. So allow us to like kind of put ourselves in a mental, mentally based situation and think about what could occur uh, and kind of create a visual representation of what could occur. The association areas of the parietal lobe deal with math and spatial reasoning. Spatial reasoning being like how you would manipulate objects and a space. So if you're trying to like pack a trunk of a car and put all your suitcases in the car, uh, then your spatial reasoning skills would allow you to manipulate that space. And then finally, the association areas of the temporal lobe allow for facial recognition, uh, where if there was damage to those areas, uh, we would still recognize specific characteristics of people like brown hair or green eyes or tall or short, um, but we wouldn't be able to connect those characteristics to an individual. Languages may be one of the most advanced things that we do. Uh, language really demonstrates just how powerful the brain is all at the same time. There are three distinct structures that are very important for language. Broca's area uh, controls the speech muscles and via the motor cortex. So that controls the muscles in your jaw and the muscles in your throat to create the sounds that make up uh, our language. Wernicke's area interprets those sounds. Uh, so when we hear words, all we're hearing is a collection of sounds, but our brain has to assign meaning to it or comprehension. Uh, Wernicke's area is the part of the brain that does that. If there is damage to Broca's area or Wernicke's area, sometimes we can experience aphasia. Uh, and that usually comes on with things like a stroke or brain disease. Uh, and aphasia basically makes it so that a person has a really hard time uh, expressing themselves uh, if it's aphasia from Broca's area, they may speak in monosyllabic words very, very slowly, like I go park. Uh, if there is aphasia from damage to Wernicke's area, it, they will be able to speak clearly, um, but the sentence may not make sense and they might add in made up words. Finally, we have the angular gyrus. And what the angular gyrus does is take those visual representations. So when we look at letters, all we're seeing is squiggly lines. The angular gyrus is converting those squiggly lines into an auditory sound that we hear inside our head. And then Wernicke's area is converting it to meaning. Uh, but when we read, the angular gyrus is kind of creating that inner monologue of what we're hearing when we read. Our brain is constantly changing due to the experience that we're going through. This is called neuroplasticity, and it's more commonly occurring in children. And this is what happens when we create neural networks. 
experience creates new pathways and new connections between the neurons. Now, an adult still also has this done as well, but it doesn't happen as fast or as frequent. Um, and it certainly depends on an adult's lifestyle as well of whether or not they're going to experience neuroplasticity. Having a positive lifestyle like mental stimulation and good social interaction and emotional health and exercise and nutrition and sleep will make our cognitive ability better and our everyday functioning easier, frankly. If, on the other hand, we have negative neuroplasticity, non-stimulating activities, social isolation, poor emotional health like depression, uh, poor nutrition, poor sleep, substance abuse, it's going to inhibit those neural connections, creating, uh, decreasing our cognitive reserve and making everyday functioning a little bit tougher. <clears throat> Sometimes the brain will reorganize itself as well in the case of damage. Uh, when a person is blind or is deaf, uh, the brain will assign uh, the functions of uh, what would normally be like the visual cortex or the auditory cortex uh, to other parts of the brain so that a person doesn't lose comprehension. Uh, if there's damage to the brain, plasticity can also cause this to happen as well, where the brain essentially reassigns uh, different structures to different functions. Uh, but sometimes the brain can't repair itself, and sometimes the brain can actually create new brain cells. This is called neurogenesis. And in neurogenesis, uh, what, we're, uh, what we see is that uh, certain structures of the brain create new brain cells pretty consistently. Others definitely do not. Um, but the brain does create new brain cells, which then migrate to the area that needs those new brain cells. The best example is the hippocampus. And the hippocampus uh, will create about 700 new brain cells every day. Finally, uh, our brain works on two levels. Uh, it works on a conscious level where we're aware of the things that we're doing and the things that we're seeing and the things that we're experiencing and an unconscious level where our brain is taking in all these details that we're not necessarily aware of. Uh, the book gives a great example of let's say you see a hummingbird. Uh, your conscious level says that's a hummingbird, but your unconscious level is taking in things like color and form and shape and motion. Uh, things that you wouldn't necessarily be aware of because you're just looking at it and say, hey, that's a hummingbird. Now, we can also say that our brain uh, is lateralized, meaning that uh, different sides of the brain are more influential uh, in different types of functioning. But there's a uh, this idea is somewhat misunderstood. This has led people to say that I am left brain or right brain, or left brain dominant, or right brain dominant. And that just isn't true. We use our brain all the time. Just certain activities uh, will require uh, more of one side of the brain than the other. And while some people gravitate more towards one type of uh, activities versus the other, so either right or left, uh, nobody is right brain dominant or left brain dominant because we use the entirety of our brain all the time. But looking at those different skills, uh, we can see that there is some differences between right and left brains. The left brain is more the logical side of the brain. So critical thinking, uh, reasoning, so like kind of logical reasoning, uh, logic, numbers, language, because we're going to have, we have comprehension as part of that. And the right brain is more artistic. It's all about facial recognition and emotional expression and music and color and creativity. And you can see the list here. Now, when we talk about people themselves, we need to look at kind of what people are made out of. Every cell in our body has a genetic map uh, that really gives us a blueprint uh, for uh, what we have. And these are, um, uh, and these are our chromosomes. Uh, we have 46 chromosomes, 23 given by your mother and 23 given by your father. Um, and a chromosome is basically composed uh, of, and this is basically the, the genetic map that makes you who you are. <clears throat> now, chromosomes are composed of coiled chains of the molecule DNA. Uh, so every chromosome we have is basically made up of this giant, like, thing of DNA. Um, and in the DNA, uh, we have, uh, and that contains the genetic information that we have. Within the DNA, we have genes. Uh, these are biochemical units uh, that uh, are tell you kind of like what you've inherited from your parents. 
some of these genes are inactive and others are active or sometimes expressed. Uh, our environment can play a pretty key role uh, into uh, how we experience those genes though, because different environmental effects can turn on genes, kind of like uh, hot water uh, allowing a tea bag to release its tea and change the water. Uh, environmental effects can, ex can turn on our genes or make them expressive. <clears throat> Genetically, uh, every other human is nearly the same um, because we share a common genome uh, within our human DNA. It's what makes us different from things like tulips, bananas, or chimpanzees. Now we know that with genes, we inherit physical traits. It's really, really easy to see. Uh, I have curly hair that I inherited from my father. But what we don't understand sometimes is that also psychological and behavior traits are uh, inherited as well. So these are, this is what we would call heredity. Identical twins are genetic copies of one another uh, and literally have the exact same DNA. Though identical twins can be different, although they will definitely look the same, they can act different because environmental effects can turn on and off those genes. Fraternal twins uh, are twins that uh, were part of two different fertilized eggs. Uh, and so fraternal twins, while they certainly share uh, some of the same chromosomes, it's not going to be the same. Uh, it, genetically speaking, fraternal twins are basically exactly the same as uh, a brother and sister or brother and brother or sister and sister of different ages. Uh, we do have shared traits though that we see in twins uh, and we do have shared traits that we see uh, in biological relatives um, and that's because we inherit some of the same chromosomes. Now we may not inherit the exact same chromosomes because we may inherit different ones from our fathers and mothers than our siblings do uh, but ultimately uh, because we're inheriting the same chromosome we do end up seeing some of the same traits inherited even in uh, siblings that are not identical twins. Now, a lot of times, all of that that I've been discussing is what's called heredity. But additionally, there's something called heritability. And heritability is often confused with heredity. Now, heritability, what it is, is the amount that the differences in two people are due to genetics. So for example, uh, height is almost 100% heritable, but the environment does play a role because if a person drinks a lot of milk when they're a kid, they might grow a little bit further. So when I'm looking at the differences between me and somebody else, everything uh, is in part uh, inherited genetically and also uh, environmentally influenced. Heritability looks at how much of those differences are due to genetics. Um, so when we look at behavior traits, uh, it can often be uh, maybe something more like 50-50, uh, where genetics plays a role in developing a difference between two people, but the environment also plays a pretty big role. Now, as I mentioned before, genes and the environment interact with one another. Uh, the environment can cause a gene to become active or expressed. Um, and uh, no, this is no better seen than in the subfield called epigenetics. Uh, epigenetics looks at how gene ex genes can influ be influenced by the environment and how the environment changes those gene expressions. Uh, this picture, I think, does a really good job. Let's say you had two identical twins, one of whom, though, lives in the desert. The other one lives in the land of dessert. The one who lives in the desert where there isn't a lot of food is going to get really skinny. So the environment has played a role on their genes and they're going to pass those skinny genes onto their children. Uh, the one who lives in the land of dessert, though, has an ice root and a gumdrop doorknob. And th those ones are going to probably get a little bit heavier and then are going to pass those heavier genes onto their children. So while they started out the same, the environment changed each one of these twins genes. And then those twins, when they have children, will pass different genes onto those children. That is the end of our lecture on uh, 
on div the divided brain and genetics and the older brain structures and the newer brain structures.